Good morning. Good morning. To our guys today, nice shirt like that. All right, let's sing together. If you want to stand, please feel free to do so. and so glad that you're here to worship with us today. Uh, if you had not heard, our, uh, our good buddy Frank is not going to be able to be with us today. Sadly, he has COVID, and so uh, you get the joy of uh, not seeing him. No, I, that's not a nice thing to say. Uh, you get the joy of uh, enjoying our time of worship, and you get to have me preach with you again today. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity, and our theme for today was a friend of God based upon some of the things that Frank was going to talk about, but the amazing part is that theme still works with what we're talking about today in our message as we look at the call of Matthew or Levi as he's known in, in the, the scripture we're going to look at today. But as we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer, uh, dedicating this time to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity we have to worship and praise your name. And just now, Lord, we just ask that as we come together in this time, as we spend some time praising you through song, through the, the sharing of, of the Lord's Supper together, through an offering, through a message, through our fellowship, Lord, that it would all be pointed towards you, Lord. That's what we desire. That's what we pray. We pray that your name would be honored in this place. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. 
Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me song, and Lord, his song, sung by flame. scriptures that uh, we wanted to use today to talk about God as our friend, the one who is worthy of our praise because of how he has provided for us. One of the scriptures that we sometimes use and we hear a lot during the Christmas season is one I want to use today. It was a song sung by Mary when she found out that she would be the, the mother of uh, the, the, the Son of God. In Luke 1, 46 through 49, she says, With all my heart I praise the Lord, and I am glad because of God my Savior. God cares for me, his humble servant. From now on, all people will say, God has blessed me. God all-powerful has done great things for me. His name is holy.
goes on to say, he always shows mercy to everyone who worships him. The Lord has used his powerful arm to scatter those who are proud. God drags strong rulers from their thrones and puts humble people in places of power. God gives the hungry good things to eat and sends the rich away with nothing. God helps his servant Israel and is always merciful to his people. The Lord made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his family forever. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope Bye. 
Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, and Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in Streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there's peace within his presence I speak Jesus well as we begin today it, it was very uh, an, an interesting week uh, and uh, uh, we had one of those moments where, like I said, you know, the, uh, I got a, a call from Frank last night, and he, uh, he said, hey, I hate to do this to you. And uh, he said, you know, I've got COVID, and uh, so I, I can't be there. And uh, um, I told him, I said, not to worry about it. You know, I've preached for many years, I, and I'm pretty good at archiving stuff that I do. And so I, I do and want to freely admit, I didn't just write this sermon last night. But uh, I, I looked for something that I thought would be appropriate for our, our conversation today. And so uh, we're going to be in, in the book of Luke, chapter 5. And um, if you didn't get a, uh, one of the outlines, uh, there's some there in the back. Did anybody not get an outline that wants one? I think Malia was getting around to about everybody. Okay. Well, today... The message I want to share with you today, uh, I titled My Moment in God's Time. Because, you know, we, we have all these moments in life that we live and we, we have things going on and, and, and we, you ever have one of those things where you feel like, man, I missed my moment. You know, if, if I had just done something, you know, if I had just tried or if I had just said something, but we feel like we've missed our moment. Well, I want you to understand that God gives us those moments in His time where he calls for us to do something significant. Um, and we have a responsibility as Christians to do that. And that first starts when we feel called to ministry. But uh, let me say it this way. The New Testament is full of stories who, who, of people who came to follow Christ in a moment because of the influence of someone else or sometimes because of Christ himself, the things that he would say and do. We see all the way back at his birth, shepherds came to worship him because of an angelic announcement. Wise men began to follow a star in the east because it led them to him. 
A few years later, many people in the city of Sychar in, in Samaria followed because of the testimony of a Samaritan woman who came and said, come and see this one who's told me everything that I have done. Nathaniel, one of his disciples and eventually one of the apostles, followed because Jesus came to him personally and told a story of things that only Jesus would know because Nathaniel was all by himself when Jesus related that story. But the New Testament also records of many who came from different walks of life as well. Shepherds, of course, the working class out there on, a, on an evening watching over their sheep, wise men, uh, men of nobility and rule who came to follow him. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, men who were fishermen, a very respectable occupation, very simple but respectable. Paul was a Pharisee, as was Nicodemus. Mary Magdalene was a demoniac who had these demons cast out from her by Jesus and followed him. They came from different walks of life, but they all had that moment in God's time when they made the choice to follow after Jesus Christ. This morning, we want to discuss how one of Jesus' disciples first came to follow him. His name is Matthew. Or as we look in the text today that we're leaving, uh, uh, talking about, it's, it's Levi. Now, where Andrew and Peter had fairly respectable positions as fishermen, simple jobs, uh, working class guys, but they had respectable jobs. Matthew was a man who had a job that was absolutely despised by most, most of the Israelite people. He was a tax collector. And the Gospels reflect the low esteem that tax collectors were held in by on two occasions comparing them with those who had prostituted themselves. Eight times they are simply classified along with sinners. And then in some cases, it says that those tax collectors were a separate special classification of sinners. These men were regarded as traitors to the nation of Israel mostly because they collected taxes for the hated Romans. And not only were they seen as traitors, but they were also seen as thieves because the common uh, plan for the, the, the Romans was to collect a tax from all, their, all the people in this, in this empire. And there was a fixed sum that they were, were collecting, but the tax collectors were on their own on many occasions to charge people any amount above the sum for their own wealth. Sometimes they would charge exorbitant amounts, putting so much pressure on the people that they were supposedly serving. I understand we have an issue sometimes with uh, the IRS, but this is a whole different can of worms. The people had to pay whatever the tax collectors demanded because these were the representatives of Rome. And so because of that, they were hated. They were despised. They were rejected and they were the outcasts of their society. But they were rich. Maybe that's how they satisfied themselves. As far as we know, Matthew is the only one of the 12 disciples who had this despised occupation. But on one day, when he was sitting in front of his tax collector booth, going through his motions of a guy or a woman coming up, people coming up and paying their taxes, and him building up the tax to, to pocket the money, the extra money on his own. As this so happened, it was the day that Jesus came walking by. Jesus chose to cross the street, stands right in front of Matthew's table, and I'm not going to just say this story. I'm going to read it from the scriptures for you. Verse 27, Matthew chap or Luke chapter 5 says, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to the disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, as a preacher, I can tell you there are about 75 different things in there that I would say, oh, I would love to preach on that. I would love to tell, dive into that deeper. But we want to take a bird's eye view of this call of Matthew. 
There's a lot going on there, though. For instance, the Pharisees don't have the, the, uh, the, the fortitude to come to Jesus and say, why are you doing this? He goes to their disciples, but Jesus recognizes this is about what he's doing, and so he answers them appropriately. There's so much here, but I want to look at the bird's eye view of Matthew's call here. Jesus says nothing more to him than simply follow me. And in that moment, for whatever reason, Matthew jumps up, closes shop, and leaves everything behind him to follow after Jesus. In fact, he becomes so excited about sharing uh, this, this following, to, to follow after Jesus, that he shares this with his friends. He holds a, a banquet, a feast, and invites all of his friends to come and meet Jesus. His excitement, I think, was summed up by the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, who said, Matthew did not know it at the time. But this man was a chosen object of grace, an appointed vessel of mercy for whom the time of, to love had come. He was about to be visited by the Son of God. What an impact it had on his life. So today, I want to look briefly at the lessons that we can learn from Matthew's story. I want to dive into to, to what goes on here and realize that there are lessons for us to learn, not only about how we are called by God, but the responsibility we have to follow this example of Jesus and invite others to follow. So here's the first point I want to make with you today. Jesus knew where to find Matthew. Now, I can tell you, this is not some special thing. It wasn't like Jesus got up that morning and said, hey guys, we got to go find Matthew. But he knew where Matthew was. He had only 12 disciples, close followers, who would eventually become his apostles. These men would become the shepherds and primary builders of his early church. And in this case, I believe that it's not a random circumstance that Jesus wanders by and says, oh, that guy will do. It's not like Jesus threw out a cast net and said, hey, if anybody wants to, come follow me. That happened. There were times that Jesus would say, come follow me, and many would. But this is not a specific, just general call. This is him calling Matthew from the life that he was living to become a follower, a, a, a student of the rabbi, an apostle one day. He was handpicked, handpicked to be one of his followers. You ever, when you were a kid, play sports, maybe it was kickball or Maybe back before it was deemed illegal and harsh, you played dodgeball or basketball, whatever the case. And the two biggest kids, the most talented players, would be chosen as captains. Jimmy, John, you guys are captains. Choose your teams. And one by one, you go first. You go. And, and, and you remember how if, if you weren't a really good player, like sometimes happened to me, and you began doing the math and you're going, wait a second, there's an odd number here. Somebody's going to get left out. Who's going to get left out? And you get to that last person. If you're lucky, they said, oh, well, <laughs> Smith's not that good, so we'll just put him on that extra team. You guys can have an extra player. <laughs> if you weren't lucky, it's like, okay, well, that's even teams. Uh, maybe you can get in on the next game. Most people wouldn't have picked Matthew for their team. At least not among the Jews. There are some churches and congregations today that have a certain level of respectability that they look for in the people coming to their church. Oh, I'm not trying to say they're hypocritical. Well, yeah, actually I am. But my point is, it's not an overt thing. It's just some people just don't always fit. Matthew wouldn't have fit in their circles. Prior to becoming a disciple with Jesus, you think Peter, James, John, Andrew, after a hard day fishing, would have seen Matthew and said, Hey, Levi, why don't you come join us? Come join us for something to eat. <laughs> no. Nobody wanted to pick him. In fact, the, the Pharisees saw Jesus eating with Matthew and his friends, and they were offended that this supposed rabbi would stoop so low as to be with this kind of people. Folks, if you ever use that phrase, this kind of people, turns out you're one of those kind of people. Because God is not a respecter of persons. But here's the truth. And it's a great truth for us. Jesus saw something in Matthew that others didn't. 
And folks, I want to give you some good news today. Jesus sees something in you that others don't. Jesus sees possibilities and potentials for ways that you can impact this world for the kingdom's sake that others would look at you and go, mm, I don't think so. But people like Matthew were the people, in fact, that Jesus looked for. And Jesus was just reflecting God. Look back to the Old Testament. It's what Jesus did. It was what God did. It was the kind of, Matthew was the kind of people that Jesus looked for. Not only people that felt, he didn't want people that felt better than, than others, that, that looked down on others and didn't like to associate with that kind of people. They didn't, he didn't want those. He looked for ones who were sick inside. Those that wanted to change their lives. People that were viewed in his mind as worth crossing the street for. There's a, a great Old Testament story. I know most of you here probably know it. If I say the name Eliab, do you know who Eliab is? Eliab was the guy. He was supposed to be the guy. You see, Samuel was told Saul isn't cutting the mustard as a king. And so he says, Go down to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse, and I'm going to show you who's going to be king. And so Samuel took off. He went down to Jesse, and he said, hey, Jesse, God's got something big in store. Bring your sons in. And the first thing that walked through the door, and, and this is a phrase we use in, uh, in sports sometimes too. You, you take your biggest guy, the one that's got the biggest muscles and stuff, you let him come off the best bus first when you got a visiting game because you want to intimidate the other team. And Eliab walks through, and Samuel's like, oh, yeah, this is the guy. Look at him. He's, he, you know, I mean, he probably had this incredible body. He was tall, strong. He's the oldest of the sons. Samuel started nodding inwardly and said, yeah, this is the one. And listen to what God says. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Don't consider his appearance or his height. What do we normally do? For I have rejected him. And don't, don't read that wrong. Don't, don't make it seem as though Eliab was a bad guy. You know, God is just simply saying, I'm rejecting him as the one who's going to be king. He says, the Lord does not look on the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God knows what potential you have. And it's so funny. Most of us know that story. One by one, these sons came forward and God said, nope, nope, nope. And Jesse goes, I'm out of sons. Probably David's mother was like, well, you're not completely out of sons. And he goes, well, yeah, I mean, there's David, that kid out there messing with the sheep. I call him in, and sure enough, he was God's guy. Like an old song I loved to sing years ago, when others saw a shepherd boy, God still saw a king. People saw David, this shepherd, but God already saw a king. Jesus knew where to find Matthew. And Jesus knew he was ready. What was he ready for? Our second point. Jesus knew that Matthew's heart was ready for change. I don't know how. I wish I could tell you. I wish I had some great insight as to know, did Jesus use his divine perception and see Matthew and go, oh, this guy's struggling. I, you know, he, he doesn't know if what he's doing is right. But when, whatever the case was, he knew his heart was ready for the change. And sometimes I think we get caught up in some of these things. We, we look at people and we look at guys like Matthew, people that are rejected, people that don't fit the social, uh, societal norms, and we say, I don't know if that person is a good fit. In some cases, we assume that some people maybe wouldn't be interested. So maybe we don't invite them. Maybe we don't talk about our faith as much as we could or should. We assume that things in their life, our perceptions about their character or lifestyle, are indicative of someone who would never surrender their life to Jesus Christ. Someone who has no thought whatsoever for living different. At least not right now. Several years ago, Lee Strobel, a Christian author, wrote a book where he describes the top ten beliefs of someone he referred to as Chesterfield Charlie. Chesterfield Charlie was a synopsis, a, a, a summary of people that were not attending church 
that were written off by a lot of other people because they didn't come to church and they weren't interested in stuff like that. Here's what the 10 that he listed. So follow along with this. This is Chesterfield Charlie. Number one, Charlie has rejected church, but that doesn't mean he's necessarily rejected God. Number two, he's morally adrift, but secretly he may want an anchor in his life, something to hold on to. Number three, he doesn't understand Christianity, but he's also ignorant, and ignorant about what he claims to believe in. He's not even sure what he believes in. Number four, he doesn't, he doesn't just ask, is Christianity true? Often he's asking, does Christianity work for me? And what kind of experience would I have if I was a Christian? He's not loyal to denominations. He's attracted to places where he thinks his needs might be met. He isn't much of a joiner. He's hungry, though, for a cause that he can connect to. And even if Charlie's number seven not spiritually sensitive, he does want his children to have a quality moral foundation. Number eight, he's proud that he's tolerant of all different kinds of faiths. But he thinks Christians are narrow-minded and hypocritical. Number nine, there's a good chance... He might try a church if someone invited him or he felt interested. And number 10, he doesn't want to be somebody's spiritual project, but he likes to build relationships and have friends. We assume sometimes that people would not be interested. And so because of that, we sort of censor ourselves at times. Maybe it's a neighbor that family member that we've talked to for years and they just don't have a desire. And so we put it off and we say, ah, oh, well, I don't know that they'd be that interested in what I have to say. And hey, if I've only got one shot, if I've only got one shot to take, I want to make sure it's a good chance of going in. In fact, it might go as far as this. We may have written them off as lost causes. Think about for a moment in your mind. I'll give you a second here. Think about a person right now that, that you can imagine and you look at and say, there is no way I can imagine that person would ever come to know who Christ is. Never have a deep and lasting relationship with the Lord. He would never be convicted of his lifestyle. There are several stories of those lost causes that God has reached. You want to talk about lost causes? Scripture's full of them. Gideon, God said, you're going to be my champion. And Gideon said, uh, not really. My tribe is the least in the whole nation, and my family is kind of the, the country bumpkins in our group. We're not that impressive. Moses, uh, I can't talk very good, guy. Maybe you need somebody else. David committed adultery. Peter impetuous, denied, rejected the Lord. Thomas doubted that Jesus was. All these lost causes were those that God chose to use in a very powerful way. Dr. Walt Lattimore wrote in Focus on the Family magazine several years ago, studies show that between 9 and 26 significant relationships are involved in each person who makes a choice for Jesus Christ. No one can be all 26, but can I be a significant one? And what he's saying is people come to, to, to become a Christian. People surrender to Christ because they've interacted with as few as nine people and as many as 26. I understand it's not scientific. He's just expressing based on some studies he's done. Maybe you know someone who has tried to connect with them. Uh, maybe you have tried to connect with somebody and share a little bit more about your faith with them. And you ran into a brick wall of rejection. If you invite someone to church, if you share something about your spiritual walk, you might be the first person to introduce someone to Jesus. But you also might be the 26th. And you might just get the privilege of sharing something truly significant that the Spirit uses to lead them to a changed life. What are the chances? I don't know. I don't have a, a magic way of telling you. All I know is that God has called for us to call others to follow after him. Here's the third thing. Jesus knew Matthew had friends like him. <laughs> it didn't throw Jesus off that when he invited Matthew to come, that Matthew brought some baggage beyond his job. 
He had friends. Not many. But my guess is most of those friends were other tax collectors. Others that didn't fit in with everybody else. Sort of misery loves company or shared grief. They came together and they, they formed bonds and friendships. And when that happened, these are the very people that Matthew, Levi, wanted immediately to share his newfound faith with. He wanted to introduce them to Jesus. Watch out for a person who's just come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. They get excited about telling other people what they just found out. Here's a very sobering comment. Uh, Newsweek magazine did an article uh, a couple years ago called Religion and Street Gangs. And it... Uh, uh, focused on a lot of things, but one of the parts of the story focused on a Pentecostal preacher by the name of Rivers. And he, this, this, uh, this preacher, Rivers, had moved into a gang neighborhood for the very specific purpose of trying to reach lost lives there. And as he was going through this, he literally sought out a local drug dealer. And that drug dealer gave Rivers a lesson in why God was losing to gangs in the battle for the souls of inner city kids. It's very sobering. He said that the, the drug dealer explained to him, I'm there when Johnny goes out to buy a loaf of bread for mama. I'm there. You're not. I win. You lose. His final comment to the preacher was, it's all about being there for them. We don't think about that when we think of drug dealers, do we? It's all about being there for someone. See, the problem with us as Christians sometimes, and I hope, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I step on some toes here. Actually, I'm not sorry. The problem for us as Christians sometimes is we tend to travel with our own kind too much. We're not in the habit of spending a lot of time with those who don't share similar values or similar faith. And it's hard for us. Because we like our friends. We like being around that. But, but while we feel comfortable here celebrating spiritual victories, it's a little harder outside of here. We get excited when somebody comes to, to saving grace and is baptized. And we tell each other, how wonderful did you hear so-and-so got baptized this week? But how many times have you gone to your neighbor next door that doesn't go to church anymore and go, guess what? One of the guys in our church got baptized this week. It's just not the way we always work. And I understand there is, there is a challenge of who you associate with. I'm not suggesting you fall into a life of sin for the purpose of, of saving people. It's not that, you know, Paul, the Apostle Paul didn't say, I became a sinner to sinners so that I might save sinners. Well, first of all, Paul already knew he was a sinner, but he didn't dive into certain sins just so that he might save people. But he did meet them where they were at, and that's what Jesus did. Christ's ministry was to the lost. When the Pharisees questioned why he would be around such people, his basic comment was, these are the people I came for. He said, you know, the sick don't, or, or, or the, the healthy don't need, need a doctor. The righteous don't need repentance. He was saying, my ministry is the lost. This is who I'm here for. Uh, Joyce Gleave, an art teacher from Mustang, Oklahoma. I love this story. I've shared it in a message. Uh, obviously, this one when I wrote it before, but I've shared it a couple times during my preaching ministry because I just love the, the, the message here. Her name, Joyce Cleave, she's an art teacher from Mustang, Oklahoma. Christian woman who had a, a, an ongoing burden of prayer and, and encouragement that she had for 600 students that she taught at public school. She got the opportunity to go to the Holy Land. And while she was there... She decided was, uh, that she would purchase 600 tiny wooden crosses that she could give to her, her students. But when she got back, she, was, uh, she discovered she would not be given the opportunity because of the symbol of the cross being a Christian symbol. She was not allowed to give their crosses out to her students in the classroom. On the surface, it seemed as though her witnessing opportunity was doomed it would seem as though she was given an ultimatum, do not hand out these crosses. And it would be easy to say, well, we could champion her if she did it anyway and she lost her job and things like that, but that's not what she did. She didn't give up and she didn't 
become deterred. Instead of giving up, she decided to embark on a, an ambitious project, one that took her over three years. Armed with those little crosses, with some gospel teaching information, she visited every one of her students at their home, all 600 of them. In some cases, she was summarily rejected. In some cases, she was applauded and thanked. And as she put it, in some cases, many parents were moved to tears that I would care so much for their child. Christ's ministry was to the lost. It's all about being there. The other truth is Christ's salvation was for sinners. You know, the Pharisees that were criticizing him, they didn't see their need because they didn't see their reality, that they were just as lost. Like the Pharisee who prayed in the story that Jesus told, I thank God that I'm not like other men, especially this tax collector. They didn't have an understanding of their true nature. Christ's salvation was for sinners, so it made sense that if Matthew had friends like him, Jesus wanted to meet them too. And Jesus used Matthew as a means to meet them. Here's the last point. How often this is true, that Jesus knew Matthew just needed a nudge. Again, I, I, I don't know. We don't have Matthew's uh, background story. Uh, there's no Wikipedia article about his upbringing or anything like that. All we know is that Jesus walked up and said, follow me. And he went, okay. That was the nudge he needed. Two words. Kind of like us saying, hey, let me tell you about something great that happened in our life and give credit to God with one of your friends, one of your neighbors. What is so novel about this exchange between Jesus and Matthew is the immediacy of this response. It gives us a little insight that there may have been more going on in Matthew's mind than we realize. He packs up his good. He leaves everything and follows Jesus. How come? Again, I get it. Jesus had the advantage of being God. Maybe he had special discernment that allowed him to look into Matthew's heart, his mind, and go, okay, this guy's ready. But he told us that we can do the same thing through his spirit. You see, the problem is sometimes we think our job is, is, is different than it is. Our job is not to talk people into believing. We are not called to talk people or convince people that they should be followers of Jesus Christ. We, we use terms like win them to Christ and converting others, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when we talk about evangelism and sharing the gospel with others, these phrases can carry a sense of obligation that we have to preach somebody into grace or lead them in the way that they're supposed to go or cause them to be convicted of their sin. But it turns out that's not our job at all. Listen, listen to whose job it is. John 16, verses 7 and 8. But I tell you the truth. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, here it is, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. It's not our job. It's not our job to tell people how bad they are. It's our job to tell people how good God is and what God has done for us. Therein is, is the answer. Our responsibility is to be ready to give an answer. You know, I have in the past used the phrase, our job is simply to give testimony of the truth of God's word. And I leave it at that. But I've come to understand that if that's the case, I'm just a glorified announcement maker. I'm that person at the, the high school who gets on and goes, today we want to thank you for it. We're going to have tater tots in the kitchen and uh, uh, the boys' uh, glee club will be meeting. Late. That's all I am. I'm just announcing what Jesus said and I'm done. Okay? I don't have any obligation. I don't have to go to the glee club. I don't have to like tater tots. I just have to make the announcement. But that's not true. I tell my story. Yes. 
I share the truth of God's word, and I leave it up to others to accept or reject the gospel. And while that's true, it's incomplete. Look at 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. But set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, and always, always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope you possess. Yet do it with courtesy and respect, keeping a good conscience, so those who slander your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame when they accuse you. In other words, we can't just say... Jesus loves you. You're going to go to hell if you don't believe in him. And then walk away and say, I've done my job. We have to be ready for the follow-up questions. We have to know God's word. We have to know the one in whom we believe. We need to be ready even for introductory question. When someone inquires both why we have such faith or belief in what we profess as well as how we can be so hopeful in the midst of hopeless circumstances or situations. You see, we're not merely announcers of God's truth. We are witnesses to the hope that is found in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. We're not just announcing things. We are witnessing to what God has done through his word, what he has done through our lives, and what he might do through someone else's life. So what conclusions today can we draw from this because of Matthew's story? Let me wrap us up here. First, as we already said, we don't have to convince anyone to follow after God. That's not our job. Oh, yes, we have a a responsibility to live a life that's appropriate, to to reflect the love and the, the, the character of Jesus Christ. But at the end of the day, it's a person's choice to accept or reject him. In the courtroom, there is a witness stand. Does the judge sit in the witness stand? Does the prosecutor sit in the witness stand? Nope. How about the jury? Does the jury take turns going, hey, I want to sit in the witness stand this time? Nope. Who does? You know. It's the witness. Only the witness does. His job is simple. Tell the truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. And then when that follow-up question comes... Just stick to the truth. God didn't call us to be the judge or the jury or the prosecutor. That role is already taken care of. So don't you worry about it. Don't you worry that you have to preach somebody into heaven and don't you worry about whether or not person should go to heaven or not. Should accept Jesus Christ. God called us to be witnesses on his behalf, sharing what we know about what God has done in his word, in our lives, and as I said, what he could do in our lives. Here's the second part. The Spirit will convict people to surrender to God. That's his job. That's his responsibility. Remember, this is the task that Jesus said he undertakes, to cause people to consider the consequences of their sin. That doesn't mean every response leads to repentance. And it's not us being rejected when we share that truth. People still have the option of ignoring the conviction that might come to their life. For every Matthew, there's a rich young ruler. He came to Jesus with such conviction. He begged Jesus, got on his knees and said, Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, do all these things. He said, I've done it. And then Jesus said, one more thing, one thing you lack, one thing that's getting in the way, one thing missing in your life. Sell everything, give it to the poor. That one thing missing in his life was seemingly that he was in some way too dependent on what he had or too dedicated to amassing wealth. Either way, the Bible says he went away sad. Why do you go away sad? Because he was convicted but unwilling to accept Jesus' truth. It was clearly conviction, but at least at this time, it did not cause him to repent of his misguided dedication, dependence, or devotion and abandon everything else to follow Christ. The Spirit will convict people to surrender to God. He'll show them where they've sinned. Will they listen? That's up to them. They need to be made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Spirit will convict them of that. There is going to come a time of judgment That's not to say that we shouldn't share those truths. It's just not our responsibility to convict people of that. When Jesus approached Matthew, the Holy Spirit, I believe, had already been working on his life. 
Perhaps he had sat at that tax collector booth for so long, longing for something to be different, but resigned to the belief that it never was going to be. Maybe he knew what he was doing was wrong, but he couldn't get out of it. And maybe he even felt bad about it, wished things could be different, but his lot in life was set. He needed a nudge. And when Jesus said, follow me, Matthew was primed and ready. He got up, left everything and followed, leaving everything he had behind. All the past schemes and lies, all the justifications and rationalizations of his life, all the regret and shame that had built up over the years, in an instant they were abandoned to simply follow. His conviction, coupled with Christ's invitation, led to repentance and resulted in a changed heart, a changed life, and a changed man. And that story still repeats itself today when people hear that message. In conclusion today, Johann uh, Wolfgang von Goethe once stated this, treat a man as he is, and he will remain as he is. Treat a man as he can and should be, and he will become as he can and should be. Jesus gave Matthew something to live up to. A different life. That's what our Savior does, and that's the exact opposite of what the Pharisees did. They asked his disciples, why would he eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? You see, the only thing the Pharisees saw in that moment when they looked at Matthew was a cheat, a swindler, a liar, and a thief. Nothing more. Nothing less. And I believe Jesus saw an innocent little boy once playing with friends. A young man who once had hopes and dreams that were nothing like the reality that he was now living. You see, Jesus sees past our past. He sees past the sin. And he sees his image in us. Like looking in the mirror, God sees a reflection of his own image, his own likeness, in the potential that we have. Pharisees treat people based on past performance. Jesus treats people based on future potential. Pharisees give people something to live down to. Jesus gives people something to live up to. Pharisees write people off. Jesus writes people in. Pharisees see a life of sin. Jesus sees the image of God flawed by the sin of the world. Pharisees assume the worst and give up on people. Jesus assumes our best and gives us a second chance and sometimes a third and fourth and fifth chance. You see, the Pharisees reduced Matthew to a label, a tax collector. He's a sinner. He's not one of us. And sometimes, knowingly or unknowingly, we do the same. And in that process, we strip people of the individual, individuality and complexity that God has given them. Prejudice is exactly that. It's pre-judging someone. It's assuming the bad stories that end badly. But Jesus is in the business of turning bad beginnings into happily ever afters. He's in the business of taking that moment in God's time and giving people that opportunity to step away from the past failures, the past regrets and shame, and move forward. The Apostle Paul understood this. He wrote to Titus, a young preacher, about his own situation, about the other apostles, about any of us who claim the name of Christ. He said in verse 3 of Titus 3, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Doesn't sound like a person you'd want to hang out with, does it? But... When the kindness and love of our, our God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. It's amazing to me how often I find myself unwittingly realizing that. That when I talk about the mercy of God... I take a moment and I pause, sometimes let out a breath of air because I realize how incredible his mercy is. His mercy looked at a guy like Matthew, 
knowing him. Knowing him in a way that others didn't know. Oh, sure, he knew all about the lies. He knew all about the cheating, the stealing. He knew about the selfishness and greed. But he knew something else. And Matthew deserved a second chance. What an opportunity for us. <coughs> Excuse me, whether we need a second chance or whether we need to offer someone else a second chance to know who Christ is. Let that season your life today. Let's pray together. God, just today I want to, to say thank you for the blessings that you have given to me, for the mercy that I truly enjoy. I know that are, there are times, Lord, when I, I take your mercy for granted, and I, I know it's wrong, but I don't want to do that anymore. I come to you, Lord, admitting my flaws, admitting my need for salvation, for forgiveness. And Lord, you have offered that and you've given it to us. Here in a moment, we're going to celebrate that through our communion. But I just thank you, Lord, that you have given that to me. And Lord, help me to be just as kind and thoughtful, forgiving of others recognizing that their story may have more chapters that need to be told, ones that include the presence of your spirit in their lives. Lord, we pray for discernment, for those opportunities, those moments in your time when we can share with someone else. But Lord, I pray as well that you would just give us a boldness that whether we discern a spiritual need, that we would be willing to, to share a testimony of our faith, a testimony of your goodness and your grace at all times. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask uh, David to come back up as we uh, share in a song that I think it gives us a, a, a wonderful truth that I'm going to guess Matthew understood in such a great way when Jesus called him. Hungry I come to you for I know satisfied I am empty but I know your love does not run dry so I wait for you so I wait for you I'm falling on my knees offering all of me Jesus I run to you for your arms are open wide I am weary but I know your touch restores my life and so I wait for you so I wait